Thank you, Marisa, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Simon, John, um, Pascal, who have all presented, and Stephanie presented before me. Thank you for taking the time to come. I know there's a lot of interesting tracks and talks going on at this same time. Um, as she introduced, I am a social scientist. So I'm taking the psychological perspective uh, of leadership, uh, especially from an employee perspective. So what are their potential thoughts, feelings, expectations, and how is it relevant? So first, Andy grew up uh, completely bilingual, so two languages. Enjoyed the freedom of moving back and forth uh, between these with friends, with family. And when it became time to choose a profession, decided to go into translation services, right? Thought it would be great to bring his talents and skills into the world. Um, although Andy's cousin had recent be, recently been replaced at work by automation by some self-service uh, checkout uh, centers, Andy thought, no, this will never happen to translation because there's no way that AI can, can approximate or that computers can approximate um, the nuances in the languages that I know them, right? Uh, so that's to start out, give you a taste of industry 3.0. So the examples when automation has taken over some jobs, as well as industry 4.0, which uh, some would argue that we're in right now. So that includes AI and automated systems, machine learning taking over um, some jobs uh, completely, uh, but a lot of times simply some tasks and some processes within those jobs. Some people are very vocal and broad reaching with the statements of, of how far reaching Industry 4.0 is saying, for example, from the uh, World Economic Forum, that AI will impact every job in every industry and in every country. So no one is safe, right? Um, Looking at specific jobs, so this was actually um, from the Oxford Institute of uh, uh, Humanity, and they looked at, uh, they surveyed several hundred AI researchers. So these are experts uh, in AI, and they asked them, of all of these professions, how long will it take before they are automated, before they're replaced um, by AI? And so you see poor Andy is gonna be out of a job sooner than he thinks because translation services are, are scheduled or expected to be replaced within just a couple years. Other things on this list, writing essays, truck drivers, pop songs, even a very uh, a meta issue of AI researchers being replaced themselves. So you see the error bars towards the end uh, go on until infinity because some people think it will never happen. Um, but this is just to give you a, a picture of, of the very kind of white collar jobs that can even be replaced. And so why am I diving into this? A bit depressing to start off a talk, right? Um, but it's the idea of technophobia. So if you break it down piece for piece, it's, it's this fear of technology and what that entails, right? So a lot of people are scared of anything that's different, uh, whether it's technology related or not. Um, but we're, when we're in this sort of technological age, this fourth industrial revolution, some would say, this fear can be very intangible. So just a general anxiety of, I don't really know what it is. I don't know how it's going to affect me down to some more tangible fears, right? Of how it's gonna affect me specifically and my job could even replace my job entirely or replace my manager or leader. And this is perhaps made a little worse uh, from people like Elon Musk, right? Who, who says robots will take your jobs, um, even going so far as saying that um, eventually governments are gonna have to pay everybody a universal income because everybody will be unemployed, right? Um, so this is really stoking the fires of these kind of technological fears. But I'm a quantitative scientist, so I'm, I'm looking into the data, right? So beyond some of these quotes and kind of um, estimations that may have a lot of error inherent in them, right? Uh, look at the, the data. What are people saying? This was a survey of 8,000 employees, so everyday kind of employees. And you see that, especially in countries with a very technological focus, almost all of them expect that one day AI will replace managers, right? So. Uh, 90% expect that AI will replace managers. It's pretty impressive, right? And this isn't just uh, uh, broadly applicable to kind of smaller organizations. Here you see uh, Ray Dalio, he's the uh, founder of Bridgewater, so the uh, largest hedge fund in the world. Uh, years ago, he went on record uh, in 2016, 17 about the 
book of the future in which uh, Bridgewater was planning to replace uh, all of their management with uh, GPS-like uh, instructions on everything from hiring and firing uh, to, to making a phone call. So down to the little details like that. As far as I could tell from recent searches, this hasn't been implemented yet. Um, but again, strong uh, uh, example of a top company with a worldwide presence that is really taking this to heart. Similar themes are echoed also in Harvard Business uh, Review, right? So uh, an, an outlet from my field that's targeted at, at managers, at practitioners who are, who are doing the everyday leadership, right? And you see that number one is, is leave administration to AI, right? So this is kind of what Pascal was talking about, um, outsourcing kind of the administrative paperwork duties uh, to a bot, right? Saving the employees their, their very valuable time to spend on other things. Um, but this is also echoed in the other two examples that I gave you, right? So um, it's all about how AI is gonna take over management. AI is gonna take over administration and organizational things. But leadership is something different, right? It's, it's more human, it can't be replaced by a robot, right? Well, um, the scholar in me wants to return to a definition so that we all have kind of a shared understanding of what I'm talking about when I say leadership. Now, I'm taking a bit broader strokes uh, than Stephanie. She got into different leadership styles. I want to talk about leadership more broadly as just a, a, a process of social influence. And so if you're talking about it in leadership, it's often a leadership and a, follow, a leader and a follower. Okay, so uh, leadership includes things like uniting people for a common goal, uh, a common mission, motivating people to achieve more than they thought possible, right? The, the employees to achieve more. And when we're talking about management, even in these articles, I don't think it's just a semantic difference. Management is often entailing more administrative, organizational kind of processes, right? So that's kind of the distinction that I'm making out here. Um, but if this is what we think of as leadership, then can robots be social? Can robots be influential? So instead of telling you the answers to these questions, I'm going to point to Jimmy Fallon. Oh. So in this short clip, it'll be about three minutes. I want you to try to pay attention to everything that you Don't consider you well. kind of human. Uh, David, you brought a friend with you here and this is really kind of freaking me out. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, Sophia, uh -huh. and Sophia is a social robot, mm -hmm. and she has artificial intelligence software that we've developed at Hanson Robotics, which can process visual data. She can see people's faces. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data, and uh, use all of this to form relationships with people. Okay, uh, so... <laughs> I mean, she's basically al alive, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, she is basically <laughs> alive. Uh, would you like to maybe give it a try? Sure. Give it, uh, I'll just say, what's, this is like, you can see how awkward my first dates are. <laughs> it's, a, it's a robot. Oh, I'm already, I'm getting nervous around a robot, a very pretty robot. Um, do, what do I just say hello to? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sophia, can you tell me a joke? Sure. What cheese can never be yours? What cheese can never be mine? I don't know. Nacho cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. That's not... uh, I, like, I like nacho cheese. Nacho cheeses. Ew. Gosh, you did, ew. Uh, I'm getting laughs. Yeah. Maybe I should host the show. Okay, all right. <laughs> Stay in your lane, girl. Uh, now... <laughs> Jimmy, uh -huh. would you like to play a game of rock, paper, scissors, robot style? Sure. Okay, let's get this game going. Show me your hand to start. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. 
I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go. Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you are incredible. It's so nice to meet you, Sophia. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Friend me on Facebook. I will, yeah. All right. Good, yeah. Thank you, Sophia, everybody. Thank you so much for bringing David. David, thank you. All right. So, who noticed kind of humanistic uh, features uh, of Sophia in this film? Just throw them out. Fine. What was it? Fine. The question is what characters? Yeah, yeah. What sort of humanistic features? What made her seem human? She's smiling. Smiling, yeah. The, how she looked, yeah. Blinking. Blinking. <coughs> Mirroring. Mirroring. Using I heard humor back there. We'll come back to that. Using irony. Irony, yeah. Also with humor, yeah. I'm sorry? Gazing? Gazing? Yeah. Okay. Following the... okay, following the person. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah? Both Jimmy and David anthropomorphized the language and at the very beginning used things like she, and then Jimmy even said, so she's basically real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So language. Key tip there. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of the first comments uh, really emphasize the appearance, so how she looked and how human that was, the, the small behaviors as well, like blinking and, and whatnot, gazing. Uh, and then we, we heard also humor, irony, so this more internal features um, that make her seem more human. And that's really what I want to uh, continue here. Right, so um, if we're thinking about humor, uh, again, the scholar in me wants to define it. So it's an intentional and amusing social act of communication. Right, so it's intentional. Um, it's not just tripping over a chair or slapstick comedy of me accidentally hurting myself, and it's social, so it's, it's with someone else, it's interactive, right? Um, and so if we, if we return to the definition of leadership that we went through before, right, a process of social influence, right, then, then humor as a social act is a key way to, to do this, to seem more, more humorous, to seem more human and potentially even more, more leader-like, right? Um, so what we know from the literature is that um, successful humor, so that's the humor that's appropriate, uh, read here, no sex jokes. Those are risky. Some people appreciate them, but most people don't. Um, it's appreciated, so that's often shown by being laugh-inducing, so um, inciting laughter in someone else. Um, this su successful humor is associated with leader selection and effectiveness. So um, leaders who use more successful humor compared to those who don't, are, are uh, they have better relationships with their followers, they're more likely to be selected for sub subsequent leadership tasks, and even their teams, the teams that they lead, show higher performance, right? So, so humor as a leadership skill is also a, a very important behavior um, that may not only make robots like <laughs> Sophia seem more human, but also make her seem more leader-like. So you're probably thinking, so what? This, this robot showed some sense of, of maybe, you might say emotional intelligence by recognizing um, some of Jimmy's reactions, um, maybe telling a, a canned joke or something, right? And eliciting laughter. Um, but I really want to highlight this kind of distinction, this contrast here, because we know recruitment experts and, and groups like the World Economic Forum are telling a bit of a different story about soft skills such as uh, humor, right? So they're saying that strengthening a soft skill is one of the best investments you can make in your career. They never go out of style. And with the rise of AI, soft skills are increasingly important and precisely the type of skills robots cannot automate. Um, with the World Economic Forum and their recent Future of Jobs report, they say something similar. So the reskilling imperative of human skills, implying exclusively human here, right? Um, will retain or increase in value with the rise of robots comes the rise in soft skills. Again, implying that these are exclusive to humans. So um, returning to a definition, I think this is my last one, so, so don't worry about future definitions. Um, soft skills are personality traits, non-cognitive skills and abilities, socio-emotional skills, goals. Um, really the first uh, three lines are important here. This is from uh, James Heckman's definition, uh, Nobel 
prize-winning economists from, from Chicago. Um, and these are important because these are the things that are not taught in school. They're not taught in formal education. But uh, they are valued in the labor market. What does that mean? People with these soft skills are more likely to be hired, they're more likely to be promoted, um, and they're more likely to be seen as, as leader-like, right? Uh, they also make for better leaders. So they have value in the labor market, right? Pascal kept talking about value creation, right? So, so there is value in soft skills. I don't want to, to um, play that down at all. And they are important. But what I do want to make a point of is that they are not exclusively human. So um, some of you may know of their whole category of social robots, right? Um, they've been applied in education, in healthcare, um, for example, in elderly care, as shown in this picture, communication, collaborative tasks. But what about leadership? Well, um, there is uh, some evidence. So this is a, a group of scientists in Germany, in Augsburg, have developed uh, at what they call an irony bot um, who uses sarcasm. And it was explicitly developed to make it more accepted by humans, right? We talked about this kind of technophobia where people are afraid of technology, perhaps especially encroaching on their workplaces and taking their jobs, right? Um, so by adding humor to these robots, um, they might be more accepted as well as more leader-like, right? So um, this kind of sounds intuitively like it would work, right? Intuitively plausible, but we know again from, from the literature um, that for example, in delivering feedback, which is one of this uh, irony bot's key tasks to deliver negative feedback. It sounds intuitive, you know, okay, you do that with humor and it goes better, right? Um, but uh, Bitterly and Schweitzer, for example, um, showed that when you acknowledge your weakness in a job interview, right? That's one of those typical questions. What's your strength and weakness? Um, don't say I'm too perfect or I care too much, right? Um, what Bitterly and Schweitzer would say is if you do it with humor, acknowledge a real weakness with humor, then it's less likely to be viewed as, as genuine, less likely to be held against you, right? And um, McGraw and colleagues in Colorado uh, showed something similar in Yelp reviews, right? So these kind of digital reviews. These negative one-star reviews were viewed as less negative uh, when they were, were uh, written with humor, right? Um, so to show you what this irony bot looks like, um, it's both in the kind of humanistic sort of features, right, external features that we talked about. You see eyes, it blinks, rolls the eyes. So again, that's very um, much uh, going along with the sarcasm bit, uh, winking as well as uh, smiling. So the very first one shows a very, very subtle smile there, right? And again, so having these, these humanistic features external features as well as uh, sarcasm, which I think is a, is a really important distinction when we're talking about humor here, right? Because Sophia did use humor too, right? She said the nacho cheese joke, and she, she made jokes about taking over the show and taking over the world of humans, right? Um, but those are kind of canned jokes, right? You could kind of make those in any context. Um, regardless of what's going on. Sarcasm is, is very much reactive to the input that it's given, right? So you're sitting in, in traffic. Uh, you could say, ah, oh, I really hate this traffic. Um, Irony bot would say, I just love sitting here, right? Um, so it's very much uh, dependent on the, the input. And that's why, um, for example, um, Arthur Yego would say that, that, that this context um, makes it seem um, more authentic um, and thus also more, more human. All right, so in the end, uh, yes, humans, of course, are interacting more with technology. Technology is taking over some of our, our processes and our tasks at work. Um, but this technology, for example, um, robots and the AI that powers them is also becoming more human, not just in how it looks, but also in how it mimics what we once thought was essentially an ex exclusively human-like behavior. And in doing this, it's not only becoming more human-like, but also more leader-like. So what does this mean? Um, I think oftentimes when we, when we think of leadership, we go to our prototypical image of a good leader, right? An effective leader. So it, it, it does seem a bit of a shame um, and maybe a threat if, if AI, or robots and the AI that powers them take over a lot of these good leadership roles, right? Um, it's probably maybe not even possible for some time, but compared to the bad leaders, 
right? Um, there's actually research out there um, showing that, for example, by Bob Sutton at, at Stanford, that bad leaders do more damage for their employees and the organizations that employ them than good leaders do to benefit those employees, right? So if you're thinking about which kind of leaders are being replaced by uh, uh, robots or, or AI, right? Um, it's, it's important to consider which kinds of bosses. It might actually be quite a good thing if these bad bosses are, are being shown the door. So, knock, knock. Who's there? Oh, come on, guys. We can't end like that. Knock, knock. Who's there? Increasingly, more hardware with soft skills. Thank you. <laughs>